Hello everyone and welcome to the second video for week 3 in AEDT Online Learning Theories and Models. This video is a general overview about online learning in K-12. So going into the video, some of the analysis questions to ponder are what are the areas of research in K-12 online learning that you're familiar with? What ones do you feel need more investigation? And then how does K-12 online learning contribute to what is considered to be effective K-12 education. Before we get into the actual um, overview of K-12 online learning, I thought that this visual was quite useful just to put things in perspective with respect to the timeline. So this has some interesting dates on here and it looks at basically the, the timeline around internet introduction and what we actually were able to do on the internet at cer certain points. So you'll notice as we go forward, 1991, the World Wide Web was quote-unquote released and there was public access to the Internet. By 93, we were starting to get a bit of a graphical interface and as we got closer to 97, we have reaching the 50 million users um, perspective. And this is taken out of a dissertation proposal looking actually at um, Gen Xers, Gen Ys, and where is the, the mosaic for Gen Z? Where does it fall? So the demographic pieces. But I thought it was useful to just see some of the timeline and progression around where the technology has been and where it's allowed us to then dovetail in. So if we look forward to then the history of online learning in K-12, thinking back to that chart, the first K-12 online learning program was in 1991. And by 97, there were some entirely online supplemental virtual schools. That's some terminology that's out of the U.S. And in Michael Barber's article, he does a nice job of explaining the U.S. terminology around what they consider to be online learning, virtual schools, hybrid schools, uh, all kinds of different terms than we would use in Canada, but ones that are extremely valuable when you start looking at what literature is coming out in online learning. So in the United States, in 2001, there was an estimate that approximately 40 to 50,000 students, or 0.001% of the K-12 student population, were in some form of K-12 online learning course. In 2011, that has grown to approximately 4 million students, which represents approximately 6% of the K-12 student population. That's quite a significant growth. In Canada, we're looking at now, remember our population numbers to draw from are already smaller, but we're looking at about 25,000 K-12 students in the year 2000 that were learning online. And by 2010, we had approximately 182,000 students or 4.2% of the K-12 student population. So the growth has really been um, quite significant in terms of K-12 students taking one or more online courses as part of their program. So let's take a look at what counts as an online program. Um, this is a figure, the citation's at the bottom there, and it, again, it's out of the United States. So when you're looking in the research around K-12 online learning, you do need to make sure you check your terminology because there are while there's a lot of similarities, there are some differences depending where the research is coming out of, international, Canada, or the United States. So this was a bit of a, a attempt, because all of this terminology has different meanings in different places, to try to define the different pieces in an online program. And this is something that was done in 2009. It's something that still, as of today, uh, is used to describe different dimensions in an online program. So what do we know about K-12 online learning? Well, we've already spoken about the advantages or the challenges or benefits and challenges of online learning in general in the previous video clip. But with respect to K-12, in 2005, here were some general benefits and general challenges. These then formed that table that you saw in the last video clip around um, the literature that tees up each of these benefits and challenges with who's been writing in the field of virtual schooling, predominantly in the U.S. So you may find it useful to go back and take a look at those two tables because there are authors in there that may be valuable to take a look at if you are good at research down this path a little further. 
In terms of the actual research on K-12 online learning, um, there's a distinction that needs to be made between published literature in the field versus literature that's based on research. And so Barber and Reeves, Rice, Kavanaugh et al. all argue very strongly and make the point that there is a paucity of research um, in K-12 online learning. And most of the themes to date that have been researched have focused on comparing student performance between face-to-face -face and online, um, examining the qualities and characteristics of K-12 online learning as an experience, and looking at its effectiveness with the lens of student retention. So a very, very thin slice, um, really when you think of the whole picture of what could be researched, a very, very thin slice of what has been researched to date partly because of the technologies available, the experiences available, um, and partly because of where the funding was for some of this research. Obviously in the early days people wanted to know is this better than face-to-face? -face? Is it equal to? Um, should we be concerned to adopt this or not? And so you see lots of those comparison style studies. Just focusing in on the research related to effectiveness of online learning, uh, to give you some sense of it. And this is quite useful. It's again from Michael Barber's articles. Um, this is from the 2011 article. And it's the sense of the study and then the finding. And again, framed in the context of the United States and their virtual schools. Although having said that, the first one is an Alberta reference. Um, so he does a bit of a dance between what we would call online schools versus virtual schools versus blended schools in Canada and this table allows you to get a sense of some of that literature. Um, the acronym FLVS is that Florida Virtual School that was one of the first ones out of the gate in 1997. And then he has quite a caution and he and other writers including Rice um, and Kavanaugh caution about this type of research around effectiveness because there's a, the real influence of student selectivity it influences participation in the samples, it influences participation in the programs, and it influences participation rates in general. So, for example, early days, some students would have selected online, this is posit, um, because they thought it would be easier, or they would get through it quicker and not have to do a lot of work. So you have to take that into consideration when you start looking across the effectiveness research to see what kind of trends are coming out of there. The other research areas that are underway, and some have more than others, and again, stepping back to an earlier slide, there is not a lot of hard research in any of these areas to date. There's people starting to research, and there's lots of literature, but it's about um, experiences of a certain group or a certain program or a certain subset, as opposed to framed as hard research. Uh, so. These are the other areas that people are looking into. Who are the learners and what are their perceptions of learning in the K-12 environment? What are some factors that affect K-12 learner achievement? And Robler et al. have developed a prediction instrument that they use and has, have validated quite successfully for predicting student success in the online environment. So that's something you may want to examine in more detail. The role of the K-12 online learning teacher so lots of folks looking into how do we prepare people to teach online, what is the role of pre-service education in that versus professional development, um, how do we manage workload, what types of policies need to flow out of that to manage workload. And then both the design of K-12 online learning and the delivery. So the design considerations include the pedagogical stance or framework that you're operating from. The delivery are things like we've discussed already to date. Is it a blend? Is it synchronous, asynchronous? How are you actually going to do it? Uh, what kind of infrastructure do you need? Technology support do you need? And then support of K-12 online learning, both for the learner, for the educator, for the institution offering it, um, for the parents on the support end at home. This is a growing area of research, um, of interest in the research. And then there's much literature, basically, um, synopsis of what people have done, but little to no research on policy or cost direction with respect to K-12 online learning.
So I'm throwing these up here uh, without providing you with much detail because I know going into your PBL you will be jumping in here in more detail. What I thought I would do in this slide was give you a sense at the high level what are the other areas of research that are out there to examine and explore and where are the categories starting to fall. This is a link to a Sir Kenneth Robinson um, video that he did for the TED Talks. It's his most recent one in 2010 and it's called The Learning Revolution and I've put it in here because of the context in K-12 and because of the connection he makes to technology in general. So I would, it takes about 18 to 20 minutes, it's one of those TED Talks. So I would encourage you to take a look at this, it's not essential that you view it right now, but I'm putting it here as a nice closer to giving that overall sense of online learning in K-12 before we get into some of our synthesis questions. So the two that I'd like you to ponder and we'll talk more about in the tutorial are what area of research in K-12 online learning is most needed from your perspective and why. So this would be based on what you know to date, um, what you've heard, what you've read to date. And the second one is, how can you dovetail the qualities of effective K-12 education with the characteristics of online learning? And then what would that look like if you start to make those dots connect? So I'll leave you to ponder those. Um, I'll leave you with the readings for this week. You've got Michael Barber's article, The State of, State of the Nation of K-12 Online Learning in Canada. And that's very recent, November 2011. And then you have another one, another one which is out of the U.S., and it's Keeping the Pace with K-12 Online Learning, and it's a review of policy and practice. So it will give you a sense of sort of where that is coming from. So I will leave you with that and look forward to our discussion in the tutorial. Have a great day.